Baptist, this is Gary DeVos, your congregational care pastor. As your pastor of care and compassion, I am excited to bring you a workshop that will be offered on Saturday, October the 30th at 11 o'clock. Now I turn it over to Jeff Harris to tell you more about this workshop. Hello, I'm Jeffrey D. Harris. What happens if an illness makes you unable to speak for yourself? Who will make important medical decisions on your behalf? Join us on October 30th at 11 a.m. at First Baptist Church Broad, where I will introduce and explain the Five Wishes document. The Five Wishes document will answer all of those questions. It will tell your loved ones what you want when you can't speak for yourself. It lets them know how far you want the medical world to go, how much intervention you want, and just who you want to do the things for you. This document will allow you to have peace, not just for yourself, but for your loved ones who are gonna make those decisions for you. And like we always say in the healthcare world, document eliminates trauma. I look forward to seeing you on Saturday, October the 30th at 11 a.m. But please take time to register first. You will see information displayed on the screen of how to sign up. Family and friends. Are you looking for a fun, safe event for Halloween? Then save the date. On October 31st, from 5 to 7 p.m., we will be hosting our very own Trunk or Treat. If you'd like to volunteer to decorate your car and give out candy, please email me at kendramore.fbcb at gmail.com or call 901-323-2429. Sharpen up on your pumpkin carving and decorating skills. Put on your favorite costume for our at-home Halloween contest. Send in your pictures to the email below by October 27th. May the best pumpkin and costume win. Hi, Deaf Youth. Did you enjoy virtual bingo when we played it? Guess what? It's back. Join us on Saturday, October 23rd at 3 p.m. via Zoom to match and win. Can't wait to see you. This Wednesday, Bible study returns live right here at The Broad. Every Wednesday at 6 o'clock p.m., we want you to tune in on our Facebook page or YouTube for your midweek fill-up with Dr. Keith Norman. Can you believe we are halfway through the year? By now, maybe you've moved and changed addresses, or maybe you've gotten married and your last name has changed. We want to make sure that we have the latest information on every member here at The Broad. So if you haven't, please log into your Shelby Next account starting October 10th through October 31st and ensure that we have the latest information for you and your entire family. If you have any questions about logging into your Shelby Next account, please call us here at the church at 901-791-0198 or you can email us at info at fbcbroad.org. During the pandemic, one of the key groups that has helped us to stay connected was the ambassador program. Now, we are asking you to help us continue to do that. We are inviting all of our members who have a gift or a call to talk on the phone to consider joining the Broad Connect group. This ministry is one that is designed to keep every member everywhere connected during these times. If you are interested, you can email us at info at fbcbroad.org. Please, if you're interested in joining the Broad Connect group, again, email us at info at fbcbroad.org. Don't forget to check out your monthly engagement opportunities with Mixed Fit every second and fourth Monday at 6 p.m. here at the Broad, 
or you can join in for Brighter Days every second and fourth Wednesday on Zoom and High Def Youth Bible Study every second and fourth Tuesday on Zoom. And please make sure you tune in to one of our prayer opportunities during the week this month. We have Monday Morning Glory on Mondays at 6 a.m. We have Midweek Manna on Wednesdays at 12 noon. And then we have Friday Night Fire every Friday at 6 o'clock p.m. All right, well, good evening and welcome to another installment of First Baptist Church Bible Study. Uh, we are actually live tonight. We have an in-house crowd so that people don't think I'm telling the story. Crowd, let's give you, put your hands together and bless God. Um, we thank God. This is really the first of the opportunities that we're offering to have in-person engagement. This is known as the soft opening. Uh, churches all around the country are doing exactly what we're doing right now as far as best practices are concerned, uh, registration and then engagement. This is just really getting people acclimated into going back into church environments, which is going to be kind of difficult. So give us some time while we work out all of the bugs. Uh, you might say, well, Pastor, some other churches went back a long time ago, and they did, and we're doing what makes sense according to what we believe the Spirit of the Lord is leading us to do in this place. And so these soft openings will continue week after week. You will get a push notice uh, that says go online and register. So we'll kind of know a count or number of people who are coming. We do ask that you would give us your vaccination status. That helps us to know the population of the church that is vaccinated. So that's good. You can also uh, go to the app right now and download tonight's Bible study outline. It is there. It's a part of the Elevation series. Uh, we're continuing in this, and we are really pivoting right now in this particular series to answer some questions uh, that people have asked over the last few weeks. Uh, and we're going to make sure that we try to drill down and get all of them. So with all of that being said, let me first pay tribute uh, to Colin Powell, General, General Colin Powell. Uh, it was important for us um, that we might pause for a moment. I don't know if there's a video that is available up there for us now. I wanted to show it, um, that we would look at the life of General Colin Powell. We like to pay tribute to those people who have made a significant difference uh, in American history. After 35 years of wearing the uniform and four more as Secretary of State, Colin Powell wasn't done serving. It was my whole life, uh, and I still perform service to America, but in a different way now. Helping at-risk kids through his foundation, America's Promise, the alliance of organizations he and his wife Alma founded to offer the chance to serve to the next generation. And so I think service to country should be an essential part of every citizen's makeup. If it's not in the military, maybe it's working with young people. Maybe it's just doing something to help your community. Because as we consider how Colin Powell lived his life, two words sum it up best. Selfless service. People look to you and they trust you because you're serving selflessly as the leader, not self-serving, selflessly. In many ways, Colin Powell was ahead of his time. As a Republican, his endorsement of Barack Obama's presidential campaign was a major moment in American politics, an endorsement he made here on Meet the Press. I think back to my Army career. We've got two individuals. Either one of them could be a good president. But which is the president that we need now? Which is the individual that serves the needs of the nation for the next period of time? And I come to the conclusion that because of his ability to inspire, because of the inclusive nature of his campaign, because he is reaching out all across America, because of who he is and his rhetorical abilities, and we have to take that into account, as well as his substance. He has both style and substance. He has met the standard of being a successful president, being an exceptional president. I think he is a transformational figure. He is a new generation coming into the world, onto the world stage, onto the American stage. And for that reason, I'll be voting for Senator Barack Obama. Whether in or out of office, Powell's powerful voice resonated across the political spectrum. A patriot awarded the Bronze Star, an Air Medal, a Soldier's Medal, and two Purple Hearts. Colin Powell is survived by his loving wife of 49 years, Alma, and their three children. All right, so that's a tribute to Colin Powell. Uh, one of my favorite Colin Powell quotes 
Never let your ego get so close to your position so that when your position falls, your ego does as well. That's a very, very powerful quote. He was one of those humble people that said, you know, don't fall so in love with where you are in life and tie your ego to it because when it's over, you know, that's what happens. And that's what happens to so many people that they become something in life. But Colin Powell continued to be a major figure on the landscape of American history long after his service as a general discontinued. All right, so that was our tribute. Get your Bible studies outlines, uh, uh, outlines on tonight. Uh, go in your Bibles, first of all, and then these passages of Scripture will be on the screen uh, as we go along. This is the first uh, of the uh, outline focus scriptures, and we're going to read these and talk about these. Um, but one of the hardest things for us to believe in the Elevation series is that we were talking and we were asking people, and the question was asked, when do you know it's the will of God for you to be elevated? We have about three more highlights that are coming up in the days to come of people who have received some extraordinary opportunities that have come. And again, elevation was not just about anything financial. It's not just about anything on your job. But sometimes it can just be in your spirit. It can be in the peace. It can be in the wellness of your thought life and the wellness of all of the things that you're striving for and just being content where you are, learning how to put your life in the hands of God and God just lifts you and brings you to a better state a better place of existence. And sometimes nothing physically changes. Your location doesn't change. Uh, your bank account doesn't change. God bless, I hope that it does. I want mine to change. But at the same time, if none of those things change, your heart can, uh, your mind can, your outlook can. And that's what you need first in order for any of those other things to ever really have any impact. And so it's so hard to believe it but the Bible points out, and we just use uh, a few scriptures each week as we come in and discuss these things, but God wants to freely give you good things. And that's so hard to believe because in, 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 in this Elevation uh, sermon series, people are often thinking, wow, you know, this happened for me, or will it happen for me, or can it happen for me? But you've got to know the will of God towards you, that God wants to freely give you good things. Let's walk through some scripture uh, so we can take a look at it. James chapter 1 uh, is the first one that we lead off with, and you can see that in your Bibles, and it'll be on the screen, but James chapter 1, beginning at verse number 16. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above. So if it's good, if it's perfect, if it's right for your life, it comes from the Lord. Don't be deceived. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. God wants to give good things to his children. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Now listen, we live in a fallen world. So in a fallen state, in a fallen world, fallen things are happening every day. Born in sin, shaped in iniquity, not quite where we want to be in the life, in the will of God in certain places. But the Lord comes along to lift us up in and through Jesus Christ. I have come that ye may have life more abundantly or that ye may have life to its fullest. We're going to look at that in just a moment. But the idea of it is that we are fallen creation. All right, Adam and Eve in the garden, fallen creation, mankind falls, and therefore we are living beneath our potential. We're not living to the fullest of what we were intended to live as in the will of God. God wanted Adam and Eve to live peacefully in the garden. He wanted them to create, to enjoy life. You know, this work thing came along. How many of y'all want to send work back to where it came from? I know, I know. I'm one of them. I'm one of them. I'd like to send work back to, you know, whoever <laughs> caused it to happen, but... It's a part of life until the end. Sorry about that. But it's a part of the fallen state. But it does not mean we cannot enjoy it. It does not mean that God can't bring joy in and through the things that are happening. But we have to live in the will of God. So here's what the first verse I want to give you tonight simply says this. If it's good, if it's perfect, it comes from God. If it's right for you, what you want in your life are the things that come from God. Remember, we prayed and we talked about it on this past Sunday, ask for it, right? So when you pray, when you ask for it, ask for the things that are in 
God's will for you. Don't ask for stuff and ask God to make it his will. Don't say, God, make this your will, because that's what you want, right? But say, God, what is your will for me? What is your will for me? And craft my heart to accept your will. Sometimes we like to go get stuff and bring it to God and say, here, bless this. Here, God, take this person right here and make them what I want them to be. Take this house right here, dear God, and put it in my will and my budget. Put all of these things. God, I want you to take this and make it your will for me. Rather than saying, Lord, lead me to your will. Lead me to your will for me. And craft me, craft my heart to accept what that will is. All right? So it's a good gift. It's a perfect gift. It comes down from the Father. He does not change like shifting shadows. It's not good one day, bad the next. It's not back and forth. It is God's will. It's God's design. Next passage of Scripture, I want you to see something. All right? Very important. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, beginning at verse number 9. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, you'll give him a snake? This is Jesus giving an illustration. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Who ask him? Once again, it's the will of God. He wants to give good gifts. As a matter of fact, God loves you and me so much that he won't give us a bad gift now, there are times he'll let us go out and get stuff in our life that is not good for us, and he'll say, you know, you've been striving and fighting for this so long, I'm going to take my hands off of it. But he did not give it to you. He did not give it. He may have allowed you to do it. You might, you know, say, well, God, why would you even allow it? Because you were going to keep on doing it anyway. I was going to keep on doing it anyway. I'm in the same line. I've been there with most of us. Amen. But here's what he says. He knows how to give good gifts. As a matter of fact, in the creation process, if he knew me before the foundation of the world was ever formed, he made me, he created me, he knew the gifts that I needed. He knew the things that he had intended for my life all along. He knew the great gifts and the great things that he had for me. So as you're looking at that outline and you're writing those notes in there, think about those good gifts that you want from God and know that God has good gifts in store in his heart with your name on it, right? Now listen, please get this. Everybody has a way of thinking that good gifts are all high-dollar items or big stuff. Good gifts can be sleep when you can't get sleep at night. A good gift is peace when you got trouble. A good gift right now is that they acting crazy on that end of the street and the Lord told you to go left. A good gift is when you have peace in your home. A good gift is when you're just happy being who you are. Those, because you can have all the stuff in the world and still be dissatisfied with self, unhappy internally. And so good gifts are those things that the Lord knows we have need of. Good gifts. Put that on your mind for a moment. What's a good gift for you? Write it in the margin. What's a good gift in my life? Uh, not looking over the fence at what someone else has to determine if that's a gift that they have, then, Lord, I want one of those. Amen. Amen. I was looking at something the other day, and I was talking about uh, getting rid of something. And, and uh, my wife asked me, what are you going to replace it with? And I said, nothing. She said, what do you mean nothing? I said, I'm just going to enjoy not having it. And it's hard to believe sometimes that you don't have to have in order to be happy. You can just say, I'm, I'm cool. I'm peaceful. It's good. It's a good gift. And the Father knows how to get. We give. Uh, the best gifts we know how. But God gives perfect gifts, good and perfect gifts to all of his creation, to all of his children. The next one, look at what the Bible says in the next passage of Scripture. John chapter 10, verse number 10. John chapter 10 is one I love. Here's what it says. The thief comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. But I have come that they may have life. And you're used to hearing that verse say, more abundantly. But I like this particular passage that says, that says, have it to the what? To the full. That sounds like it's a, 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 another, you know, kind of interpretation. That sounds like, what brother wrote that? So I want to talk about life to the full for a second, all right? All right? So I have four vessels up here, right? I have four vessels. I don't know if you can see my vessels, all right? These are just vessels. This is a vessel. Anybody see it? 
Y'all see it? How many of y'all like this one? Like this one? This is vessel A. Raise your hand if you like vessel A. All right? What about B? Everybody like B? All right, that's B. How about C? All right, C. All right, I'm going to ask you questions now. All right, how about D? How about vessel D? Vessel D. All right, how many of y'all didn't raise your hand at all? Where are my no vessel people at? You, don't, you just don't like any of them, right? All right, so you're going to be left out of the example of the equation because you didn't like any of the vessels, right? Everybody's about to get something if you like something in the vessel, right? Now, I'm going to fill these vessels up with something, and according to what I put in the vessel, that's what you can have because you decided which vessel you like, right? All right, so I'm going to go through it again. Who likes vessel A? You can change if you want to now. How many of y'all like vessel A? All right. How about vessel B? Okay, you done all of a sudden start liking vessels now. I'm going to see that. The people have jumped ship, okay? How about vessel C? All right. And vessel D. Why did you like A? Where are my A people at? Somebody just tell me real quick. Shout it out loud. Why did you like A? Doesn't take much to fill it up. Here go my people who die. I don't need much false humility. I love y'all, all right? How many of y'all like B? How many of y'all like B? Because this is going to get you a lot, right? How about that, right? Okay. What about C? Give me my C people. You just like the shape of it. It's cute. It's pretty. How about D? All right, D. All right, so watch this. Here's the container, right? And I'm going to fill that up. Is it full? How many of y'all think it's full? No. All right. Now is it full? All right. Full vessel. Is that full? What is it? Three quarters. You want more? Well, I'm talking to my C people now. This is your vessel now. You want more? All right. How my B people feel right now? Because I skipped over you. How you feeling? You feel left out, right? You went from A to C, and that picture ain't got but so much in it, right? And you filled up A, and the people in C said they want some more. But tell me what I'm going to do. I tell you what, since you asked for it, C, did you ask for it? I'm going to fill you up. How about that? Is that good for you? That's good? Hold on. I tell you what. Since that was good for you, guess what? And I want you to be full. I want you to have it to the full. Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to give you some more, right? Now, this is empty. How my people, how my D's feel? How my D's and my, my B's feel? Where y'all at? You upset? You feel forgotten? You feel left out? You looking at A? You looking at C? And you saying... What about me, right? Let me tell you something. As a part of God's plan, God never, ever forgets or leaves anybody else out, right? He always has some reserve, and he has more than enough to go around. So not only is he going to fill up A, not only is he going to fill up C, but I want you to hear this word, in due season, somebody shout, in due season. He comes back and he said, guess what? I'm going to give you what you want. And guess what? He gave you according to your capacity and you got some overflow too. And then here go my D's over here saying, wow, we got, to, we, we got left out. Watch. And God says, I got some for D too. And you filled up too. And he never forgot anybody. And so what he does, and here's the real, real definition of the word fill it to the full. He does not fill it just to the level full. God puts so much that it's just overflow and abundance everywhere. And he lets it spill all over the place. Guess what? So you can have some to share. God is always interested in making sure that you have what you need, but not stopping there, but to make sure. And then, by the way, by the way, for the non-container folk who didn't choose anything at all, right, there's some left over for you too. There's always more with the Lord. And don't get to the point where you look at what happened in somebody else's container and feel as if, God, you done forgot about me. 
Can I tell you what he does? He gives each to their own ability. He gave some five. He gave some two. He gave some one. He gave everybody what they could handle. And if you got this little container right here, God didn't treat you any, he didn't, God, you gave this person, no, I didn't. I filled you up just like I filled them up, just like I filled them up, and just like I filled them up. I gave you a full life according to your ability. The Lord gives elevation, assignment, benefit, whatever you choose to put in that blank. He gives it to you according to what you can handle, but he has enough so that no one is ever forsaken or forgotten. I want to go to the next passage of Scripture, the next, the next piece. God never forgets or forsakes. That's important in this because when you were looking at A and D, you did begin to feel a little left out. I knew it. That's why we designed the illustration that way. We wanted you to feel that feeling. How did that feel? And when you felt, how many, how many of y'all felt a little left out? Being honest, my B and D folk, how many of you felt a little left out? All right. What does that feel like? Forgotten, right? It feel, I, you forgot me, right? Does anybody ever feel like God has forgotten according to? No, be honest with me. Talk to me. Is this the real Bible study group back or y'all done got holy since you left and don't want to tell me the truth? Yeah. I, you know, hey, God, it's taking you a long, I mean, look, I saw you do all this for these people right here. And I got to be honest with you, I didn't even think they deserved that much. And you, they were spilling it all over the place. It looked like you would have just stopped them and said, I'm going to give you a little bit, then I'm going to give you a little bit, then I'm going to give you a little bit, then I'm going to come back and give everybody some. But you filled them to the rim and then went over here and filled them up and skipped all over me. I've been working the same number of years as they've been working, and they keep getting promotions. I've been here as long. Matter of fact, I've been here longer than they've been here. And we can feel forgotten. Listen, if forgotten and forsaken was not a feeling, there would not be a passage of Scripture in the Bible to talk about it. The Lord knew that people, humans, creation, saved folk, me and you, would feel forgotten. When is it going to happen for me? When is it going to come for me? All right? When is it going to take place? I told the camera people I was going to stand right here, so I'm not going to move. <laughs> Psalm 37, verse 25. Look at what the Bible says. I was young, and now I am old. Yet, I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor their seed big bread. Verse 26 says, they are always generous and lend freely, and their children will be a blessing. He then says, turn from evil to do good, and you will dwell in the land forever. What the psalmist is saying, look, he says, God will not forsake you. God has not forgotten about anybody in this space on the airwaves or anywhere under the sound of my voice, or even if you're not and you hear it later. God has not forgotten. God does not forget. He is an eternal God. He does not forget. He has time in his hands. And so because he has time, he says, look, you're anxious, and this is what happens to us. We're anxious because we live within the confines of time. We feel days slipping away from us. We feel moments slipping away from us. We feel time slipping away. We're saying, when is it going to happen for me? When is it going to come my way? But God says, look, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. The, uh, the psalmist says, he said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. He said, nor their seed beg bread. He said, they are always generous. What's going to happen is not only will you receive in time, but your spirit will be cultivated in time to be able to give to others. I learned this very, uh, 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 I, I learned something years ago. Uh, I was living in Indianapolis, Indiana, and I learned that there was a thing called the spirit of philanthropic giving. 
So guess what I chose to be, what I wanted to be when people asked me, what do you want to do? I want to be a philanthropist. Yeah, that's what I want to be. Well, don't you want to be a this? Don't you, don't you want to be president? No, I would rather be a philanthropist. You know what that means, right? In order to give it, I got to have it. I can't give what I don't have. And I can give it, philanthropists give freely. They are happy to give, right? Now, look, I ain't happy to give you my last nothing. I'm happy to give because I know I got some more to give. And so I said, you know what, Lord? That's where I want to be. And so what the Lord says to us, he says, never seen the righteous forsaken. He said, I was young, now old. This is the psalmist writing. I never seen the righteous forsaken, nor their seed, nor their children want or desire for anything. Verse 25, 26 says, they are always generous and lend freely. Let's go to the next passage. I want you to see something very powerful here. Isaiah 49, you're going to read, when you get a chance, really read verses uh, uh, 8 through 21 or, or read all of that, but I want you to focus on 14 and 15. When, just let it sit there as I read through the others, okay? Uh, we couldn't get all of it on there, but here it is. Isaiah chapter 49. I'm going to read verse 8. This is a conversation. Zion, the Lord, but Zion said, I'm sorry, I'm going to start at verse 8 if you, if you get there. <clears throat> this is what the Lord says, in the time, in the time, in the time of my favor, I will answer you. So remember this. When the Lord is going to bless, it's going to be in what? In his time. In the time of my favor, I will answer you, all right? In the time, in the time of my coming to share and fill you up, you're sitting here right now with just a little bit, and in my time, I'm going to fill you up. In my time, right? I'm not going to do it in your time. I'm going to do it in my time. I might do it a little bit, what? At a time. I might do it a little bit at a time, right? We grow in grace, don't we? All right, so the Lord may do a little bit now. He may come back and do a little bit later, right? Here's the thing. As long as you live to see it, as long as you're here to receive it, celebrate it every day, right? If the Lord says, okay, I'm not going to give you all your blessings at one time, right? I'm going to just give you a little bit at a time. Everybody else around you is full, right? What's your problem? What's your problem? What's our problem? We are doing what? Looking at the full folk. Looking at the full folk, rather than saying, thank you, Lord. See, you know what? Y'all are slower than the last group that was here, right? There you go, right? A little bit at a time, right? Thank you anyway, right? He just passed by. He ain't even give you nothing, right? He says, in my time. He's talking to them. He's saying, in my time, I will show favor. In the day of salvation, I will help you. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for my people to restore the land, to reassign its desolation, its inheritances. Uh, that, that's a powerful piece I don't need to rush through. The reassignment of inheritance. The reassignment of inheritance. That means it was intended or looked like it was headed somewhere else. And the Lord said, you know what? I'm going to reassign this inheritance. What was headed here, instead of it going here, guess what? That's how we get full, and that's how the overflow occurs. We see more than we were expecting because God reassigns inheritance, and God does do that. God does take, the, you, you've heard the passage of Scripture, uh, the, the, the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous, right? He'll reassign inheritance, all right? He'll say to those captives, come out of darkness and be free. They will feed beside the road. Uh, I will turn the mountains into, uh, into plain places. The highways will be raised up. Verse 12, they will come from afar, from the north, the south, the west. Uh, go down to verse 14. But Zion says, when the Lord is saying to Zion, when he's saying, I'm going to do this for you, the hard part for them is to believe it, right? Because what? They've been surrounded by their captivity. They've been surrounded by being in a low space, in a low place for so long. What are some of the low places in the Lord? I've been sick so long. I've been single so long. I've been broke so long. I've been in this space so long. Whatever this space is, you can become accustomed to it. And then the mentality is, I've been here so long, can't nothing good happen down here. 
But look at what he says in verse number 14. Zion says, the Lord has forsaken me and the Lord has forgotten me. I've been here so long. I think the Lord done turned his back on me. And I think the Lord has forgotten me. If this were not in Scripture, I, did, I wouldn't think, well, maybe people can't feel that way. But it's there for a reason. Because it's a reality in the life of people. Talk to some young African-American male who does not have hope. And he has not seen generations in his family prosper. When he has seen prosperity happen everywhere else. When he played basketball, but the other kid played basketball who happened to go to another school who got in school on a basketball scholarship, and he used to beat this kid just for play. And he's saying, it doesn't happen for me. It doesn't happen for me. Talk to the kid who scores a 35 on, on the same uh, standardized test that some other kid scores a 32 on, and they get into college because their dad knows somebody, but this kid over here only gets a Pell Grant and can't afford to pay the rest of it. You know what they say? I, I bet God, the Lord has forgotten about me. I hear about this stuff happening for everybody else. I just don't hear about it happening for me. This is the reality of people. It's not so much that people are bad or people uh, don't want something, but their hope has been confined to a reality and an existence that they have not seen any change in for many years. My mama lived here. My daddy lived here. Their parents lived here. This is where we live. Nobody in my family ever owned one of these. Nobody in my family ever did this. What in the world is retirement and traveling around the country? I didn't see that. The Lord has forsaken and forgotten me because this is not a part of my reality. But here's what the Lord comes back to say in verse 15. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? The Lord says, I'm so intimately in love with you. Do you know it is impossible for me to forget you? I, look, I gave birth to you. I created you. I made you. I knew what you needed before you ever knew what you needed. Before you ever knew what you wanted, I knew what you needed. And he says, I love you. Look, and have no compassion. It would be completely out of the will of God and impossible for God to not have compassion. Because God is L-O-V-E love. God is love. And if God is love, it's impossible for a loving God to not have compassion. He says, can a mother forget the baby? Where's the baby? Where's the baby? Where's the baby? Where's the baby? Put it on the screen. They missed it. They didn't hear. Where is the baby? The baby is at her breast. Right? Brothers, I need y'all to just do this with me for a moment, okay? I know you, you, you can't breastfeed. I know the women know, right? But just put the baby right here for a moment. Go ahead, women. Y'all help them out a little bit. Some of these brothers, these babies are going to starve. These brothers ain't they're not going to make it. Now, sisters, y'all put the baby right there for a minute. Put the baby right there. I ain't tell y'all to let the, see, you done, the baby done fail. Your baby done fail. You done drop the baby. He done, you see, you, baby on the floor. You can't forget that. You can't, as tired as you are, you won't fall asleep, don't you? But you can't do it, can you? Do I have any mothers in here who, who, who yeah. yeah. You a rock and your eyes will be closed, right? You rocking right now. The Lord is saying something very powerful in this passage. He's saying, when you feel forgotten and forsaken, it is impossible. And look at what he says, though she may forget, I will not. Even if it was possible for her to forget, he said, I will not forget. Whatever the prayers, I want to take some of us back. I want you to go to your childhood prayers, the innocent prayers. I want you to go to the, the child, before you knew what a Lamborghini was, I need to hear that prayer, that innocent prayer. 
Lord, just help me to be a, this one you were trying to be, a something that didn't have anything to do with a possession. And that, Lord, help me to do. Lord, I want the pure stuff. And he says, I have not forgotten nor forsaken. Can I give you one that's not on your list as I begin to think about it as the Lord begins to speak uh, in this particular passage? Um, Jeremiah 29. We love Jeremiah 29, uh, uh, 11. But let's go to Jeremiah 29, verse 4. Um, matter of fact, I'm going to run over there to it. They don't have this one on the screen, uh, television, uh, internet audience. So let me just read it real quick. Uh, God is writing a letter to people in captivity, right? This is a part of a letter. This is a part of a communication that God sends through the prophet to someone who is in captivity. If God wanted to speak to some of us right now, he uses various means and ways to communicate with us. He uses his word, right? He will use vessels that he has anointed to speak his word. He will use books and media. He uses modern-day communications, your devotionals and things of that effect. But God knows how to get a living word. I shared this with you a few weeks ago. Not grappa, uh, but rhema into your life at just the right time that speaks to just the right situation at just that specific moment. And so what he does to the people is he sends them a living word in this situation. Watch what happens. This is what Jeremiah 29, uh, verse number 4. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Where are they? They are in exile, right? They are in Babylon. They have been taken out of Jerusalem, and they are in a captive situation. Is that good? No. It's a bad situation. And who is it to? To everybody. He said, this is what the Lord says to all those. And who, allowed, who carried them away? He did. I allowed it. He carried them away, right? Build houses. Now, wait a minute. In verse 4, you're saying, this is to the folk who are in captivity. This is to the folk who are in Babylon. He says, this is to the folk who left Jerusalem, the mother country, the motherland, the place of prosperity, and you're down in captivity in Babylon in a not-so-good place. The first thing he says is build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Verse 6, marry and have sons and daughters. Hallelujah. My children are here tonight. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. He's telling them to what? Prosper. Wait, 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 wait. I'm confused, Lord. I'm confused. Because here we are and we're feeling forgotten and forsaken in this carried away captive place, in this condition, in this land, in this space, we are feeling forgotten and forsaken. And you send someone to tell us to do all of the stuff that are signals and signs of prosperity. Watch again, verse 5. Build houses and settle down, plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number. Do not decrease. Also, watch what he says, seek the peace and the prosperity of the city of which I have carried you to dwell. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you will too. Guess what ought to be on your prayer uh, list every day? Wherever you live. Memphis, shooting up Memphis, right? Post office Memphis. Carrieville, amen, right? Because if there's no peace in the place where you live, there's no peace, right? So he says, pray for the city of which I've caused you to dwell. Pray for it because if it prospers, you will too. Yes, this is what the Lord God Almighty said. Do not let the prophets and the diviners and those around you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams that they encourage you to have. 
They are prophesying to you lies in my name. I have not sent them. This is what the Lord says, verse 10. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, not necessarily for this particular group in that Babylon time, but all the time that occurred before then up until now, when 70 years is completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. Then he says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. We like to get to verse 11, but you ought to know the blessing is in verses 4 through 10. See, the blessing is when the Lord says, I got my eyes on you. I know exactly what you're going through. I know exactly how long you can handle it. You can't handle it a day past this right here. I set an expiration date for it. It is already timed out, and you're still going to be here. I've told you to do things that will extend beyond the time in which you're going to be in the situation that you're in. Man. Just the fact that you know you're going to outlive it ought to make you happy right there. Just the fact that you know that God has spoken about your existence in a happy space, way beyond the trouble that you experience. Man, when the Lord starts showing you pictures of your future and start giving you that insight, shoot, man, think about that. That's a good thing right there. And that's a happy place. And he says, I've not forgotten about you. I like that. Because I love to know, I love to remind people that God doesn't forget. God doesn't forget. People forget, but God does not forget. All right, I stayed there too long. Let me go to the next passage. We've got to be out here in 15 minutes. If you stay beyond 7 o'clock, turn the lights out. All right, here we go. All right, God does not forget, but God looks forward to blessing you. God looks forward to blessing you. Now, this is something that I think people sometimes uh, read through and don't really get it all. God doesn't forget or forsake, but how many of you know that God wants to and is excited about blessing you? Uh, look, at, look at Malachi 3.10 for what it really says. Watch what Malachi 3.10 says. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, right, that there may be food in my house. No, don't worry about that part, you know. But this is the part, see, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Here we go again. I don't know what to do with this extra. I don't know what to do with this overflow. I don't know what to I would just take it and throw it out there to y'all, but the staff would be mad at me tomorrow saying, you threw all that candy all over the sanctuary. But here's what the Lord says. You're already full, but if you're just obedient and do what I ask you to do and just test me in this, I'm going to throw the windows of heaven open. And look, you're saying, I can't contain it all. Anybody else got a container? Because I give you some of mine. Because rather than me letting mine go to waste, I'd rather share it with you. He says, I will, look at the, look at the, look at the language. Look at the language. Uh, one of the things that, that, um, that we were taught in rhetoric, in, in, in rhetoric and use of words and body expression and all this communication, look at the, Look at the words in this passage. Throw open, right? Get image, take the image of that. Take the image of that. You bring the whole tithe to the storehouse that there'll be room, there'll be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. And watch how strong the language gets. Throw open the floodgates of what? Throw open the floodgates of heaven. Think about that for a moment. If I, if, if you, all right, now, now you have seen uh, Hurricane Katrina, right? Y'all saw the imagery of that? Uh, Ida and the most recent one. Y'all saw all of the storm, right? You saw all of the, the ugliness of the water flowing over the banks and destroying the city and, and just everywhere and just, it, was it devastating? Did it look ugly? Did anybody see it? Uh, was it bearable? Was it something that you want to see, right? All right, flip that and imagine that those were blessings. 
Flip that. Flip that. Here's your life. Here's your life. Here's your life, right? Here is your life. And one day, out of nowhere, because you've been obedient to God, and you've done exactly what the Lord told you to do, and he said he gave you permission to test me in this, and he says, I'm going to just throw open the flood. I'm going to go to the levee. I'm going to take the levee. I'm going to take my hand and just smack it out the way, and in comes every blessing that you could ever imagine. Blessings everywhere, right? Now, look, I'm, I, don't, I, I try not to put names on blessings because if I name it one way, you'll think I don't have that, so I'm not blessed. But you put it in your mind what the blessing is. You put it on your mind what the blessing is. What is the blessing for you? I told y'all sometimes, the blessing for me, write them down, jot them down. What are the blessings? What is it for you? It might just be some peace and some joy, right? It may be a cabinet full of uh, uh, fruit Loops, I don't know. I mean, you might just say, you might just say ooh, we, I got every kind of Fruit Loop they ever made. Do they still make Apple Jacks? They do? All right. Huh? Right beside the Fruit Loops. Right? It may, I don't know what it is. But just imagine, look at how strong the language is. Pow. Throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to what? I chose that passage for a reason. What happens to us when we get blessings? We try to do what? Keep it all. He said there's not room enough to store it, right? So how many of y'all are selfish and you're going to say, okay, well, I ain't getting nobody none of my candy. Now, I mean, you know, y'all ain't going to eat this much candy in a year. So give somebody some of it. One of the keys, remember the blessing of Abraham, Genesis chapter 12, that you will also be a blessing. It was never intended for you to store it once the Lord gave it to you. It was intended for you to share it and to be free with it. The Lord looks forward to blessing you and it's because, A, your heart has been conditioned and crafted so that you know what to do with it. And you know to give it to someone else or to share it or to at least tell them, I'm going to keep all my candy, but Pastor got some more. Tell them where you got it from. Tell them how to get it. All right? Next passage. and We're just about wrapped up. Matthew 6, 33. What's the priority? Seek ye first. The Lord gives you the, he, look, look. Jesus gives you the prescription in the word, right? All right? Tithe, Malachi 3, 10. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, right? And his righteousness. And all these things will be what? Given to you, right? We don't have to strive for it. We don't have to contend for it. We don't have to fret ourselves like evildoers. We don't have to struggle for it. God wants to and desires to add good things to our life. Good and perfect gifts come from the Lord. He wants to add these things to your life. He tells us how to go about getting it. We have fallen into the world trap. Work hard. Work harder. Right? Practice makes perfect. No, it doesn't. Practice makes better. Practice makes consistent. Practice makes sharp. Kenya was messing with me today. And she came to my office and she's laughing. She said, you know what? This office is a little different from most that I've been in. I said, what do you mean? She said, you got every kind of Bible in here that I've ever seen. I said, oh, that's nice. She said, but you know the funny thing about it? I said, what's that? She said, they're all open. Practice. Keep working at it. And it's a joyful thing, not a striving thing. Yeah. Just read it. Fall in love with the word of God, and out of you will flow living waters. It'll, it'll come to you. He'll, he'll, he'll make it a part of you, right? Seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness. 
right? And all these things will be added unto you. Listen, I want us to get out of this habit of telling young people that you got to work harder. You got to work at it, right? But you know, some of them are working as hard as they know how to work. And they're working and not seeing anything happening. And because they're working and not seeing, because it doesn't happen for everybody the same. Am I right so far? It doesn't happen for everybody the same. One can do it and it's like this. The other one can do it hard, hard, hard and never get it. But you tell them to do their best and be consistent at it. Just try. Just keep doing what you're doing and let me know where you are in this. And then pray with them. Because we're going to create a generation of folk that when they don't see things working out, guess what they're going to do? I'm going to take this. I'm, I know what will work out. I know what else will happen. And we don't want that. All right, next passage of Scripture, then we're going to wrap it up. It's Psalm 37. i got to get to that one because I really want you to read that whole passage uh, yourselves. But here's what I want you to see. This is something I used to teach over and over and over again. Trust, delight, commit, and rest. Trust, delight, commit, and rest. All right? If you wrote down anything from Psalm 37, write down this. Trust, delight, commit, and rest. The way to get to that peacefulness in life, watch this. Do not fret yourself because of evildoers or be envious of those who are workers of iniquity and do wrong. All right, got to stop and explain that. Don't look at what other people are doing and get caught up because it looks like they're getting somewhere faster in their life than you are. Every young man needs to teach a young man that. Every young woman needs to teach another young woman that. Don't get caught up in thinking that you, you know, are not getting somewhere because you're looking at someone else and they're getting there faster. Don't let that mess with you. Get that out of your head. If most of us will be honest with ourselves, we have looked at at least one person at one time in our life and wondered why or how they got to where they are and why I am where I am. At least once. It's natural. If the word wasn't here to teach us not to do it, I wouldn't think so. But the word is written for a reason. Don't be envious of those who do wrong. Don't do it. It's easy to look and see, right? Because it looks good. I didn't say it looked bad, did it? It looks good, right? You ever looked at somebody that has something that just looked good? It looked good, right? And then you look at how hard you work, and you wonder if I could have one of those, why can't I? Or something at least like it, right? Right? You ever felt like the person, I see y'all done got real say. You ever felt like the person that was doing right all the time and, you know, you know folk around you doing wrong and they seem like they're prospering? Yeah. Well, you got a mask on. That's right. All right. I forgot. But, yeah, it's easy. That's why this passage is here. That's why it's here. <laughs> it's here because we have these kinds of feelings. Don't fret. Don't, don't. Now, don't trip about this. For they, like the grass, will soon wither and like green plants, they shall die away. It's just a natural process. He didn't say anything bad was going to happen to him, right? But you had some nice-looking plants in your house, and one day they just turned brown. Eh, they just die away. That's all. It doesn't last forever. He's saying what they're doing is not last forever. He doesn't say that, you know, they shall soon be shot dead. That ain't what they say. We don't wish that on anybody. But what it says is, is that it just won't last forever, right? It won't be green always. The seasons are going to change. So he said, don't look at that and get caught up in it. But then he gives us a prescription of what we should do. Verse 3, trust in the Lord and do good. 
right? Somebody say, that's hard. Dwell in the land and enjoy safety. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and do his will. He will make your righteousness a reward, and it will shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Rest before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out wicked schemes. Refrain from anger. Turn away from wrath. Do not fret, for it only leads to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. I'm reading it all for a reason. A little while, and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found. Don't name any names. Please don't. Don't start, because y'all start naming names, and, and you know. But think about it. Any people missing who you thought was on top a few days ago? You think, you know, the Lord said, no, he just says they just, they just won't be there forever. But you're still here, and he's still giving you opportunity and grace. A little while, and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found. But the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. I'll stop right there. Um, steps of a good man are ordered. He, those who delight in him, verse 23. That's the point I wanted to get to. So here's the wrap-up of the lesson. Time for us to get out of here. Here's the wrap-up. The Lord wants to do good things for you. The Lord wants to give you this, 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 whole, this whole illustration is based on really the one connotation of or the, the the connotation of John 10.10. 10. He wants to give you a fully full life. The word full in that particular passage of scripture, if you'll go to it just for one second, uh, John 10.10. 10. The word full is hard to conjugate. It's hard to interpret in Hebrew. And so when they talk about it, they use the description that something that is full is really overflowing. Something that is full is called fully full. And he says, even in um, John, 10, John 15, uh, verse 10, I believe, somebody check me, I could be wrong, but he says that your joy may be full, full, or that your joy may be complete. In other words, he wants you to have a fullness. God doesn't just want you to have enough. God doesn't just want you to be, he says, look, this is the inheritance of the children of the earth, right? So that's good, you know, that's good, that's good, that's good. But he said, it's okay for you to be full. It's okay. You know, it's okay to be okay every day. It's okay to be okay every day. Well, I was okay Monday and Tuesday. I had a bad Wednesday and Thursday. It's okay to be okay every day. If, if you've been accustomed to being sad 10 days in a row, how about being happy 10 in a row? Right? How about no lack for the rest of your life? You've had days of lack, right? You've gotten accustomed to that. How about the Lord saying, okay, I want you to be fully full. I want, you, I want, I want your life. Now, look, he didn't say you weren't going to have a cousin that had a, a hand shaped like a cup. Right? That's what, that, that comes with it, right? Y'all will catch that on the way home. But he's saying, look, it's okay. It's okay to be full. It's okay. God freely wants to give you good gifts. I'm going to pray for good gifts tonight. That's what I'm praying for, right? But I'm not praying for good gifts in the only tangible sense, right? If all of your good gifts that you put on your mind tonight can be purchased at Target or Macy's or Nordstrom or Saks, then maybe you have not aimed high enough. Maybe you have not thought about what you really need out of life. Put something on your mind that only God can do. And that's what we're going to ask for tonight. We've been talking about asking, right? 
So we're going to ask God for the good gifts that he freely wants to give. Now, first thing I want to do is I want to say, Lord, thank you for not forgetting or forsaking. If you've ever thought that, just whisper it in your own voice to the Lord. Lord, forgive me. I, I felt it, but, but thank you that I know now you didn't do it. You have not forgotten me. You have not forsaken me. And before I come to you and ask you for a gift or the good and perfect gift that you so freely give, I want to tell you thank you that I now know you have not forsaken me. And then, now I'm excited to know that you look forward to blessing me. You were holding it for a time in which I was ready and that I am now ready to receive it. Prepare me as a vessel. Remember, now, I'm going to tell y'all something. Y'all came in here and y'all just saw these pretty vessels. I shined these vessels before y'all got here. I cleaned them up. I peeled the labels off of them. I took all of the stickers away. I put them in hot water and soap. I cleaned them up. I got them ready to be able to receive the good things that they now hold and contain. Man, some of these vessels had fingerprints all over them. Some of these vessels had, you know, stickers and stuff. I had to get alcohol and put on them. But these vessels are ready now. Some of these vessels right here can fool you too. This vessel, small. This vessel, tall. This vessel right here is round and pretty, and this one has a lot of decor on it. This vessel right here came with some flowers. This vessel right here got a chip in it. It was in the discarded section. This vessel right here came from the dollar store. You can find them in there, and they're all a dollar right there on the little, if you want some little uh, glass like that, they're all one dollar. This one all decorated and stuff like this. But if the lid get broken, it's of no good. They're all different. We're all different vessels. We've all had our challenges. We've all come from different walks in life. Your vessel ain't no better than nobody else's vessel. Your vessel got to be cleaned up like my vessel got to be cleaned up. But the good news about it, when you look at them vessels up there, if I hadn't told y'all the backstory of the vessel, you wouldn't know nothing about none of them. Because they're all full with the good things that God in time gave to each of them. When you think of your good thing, would you stand and pray as we get ready to leave? Have you thought about the good thing that you want to ask of the Lord? Now, you know there's a manufacturing delay and shortage in the land, right? Y'all looked at the grocery stores lately, right? Shelves are empty, stuff like that. They said it's going to be a backlog and a delay on some products for up to a year. And then guess what they said? The prices are going up on everything. Procter & Gamble said they were going up across the board on all of their prices, right? I looked at it and I said, why are you going up on the price? They said, because it's going to cost more to produce. How do you know? You ain't produced nothing yet. Here's my point. God's good things are in great abundance. Just when you thought he was out just because this vessel was empty, he had some more. And it was within arm's reach. And just in case y'all were to challenge me on that, I told them to put me two more boxes of that candy back there in my office. I can run back there and get it and need it. Because the Lord has it in great supply. Father, in the name of Jesus, at times in my life, I got to admit that I felt forsaken and even sometimes forgotten. Some things happened, whether they were of my own doing or whether I just didn't know any better 
or whether it was circumstance in life and it happened, it happened. And I felt like I was in a place where grace did not abide and felt like a captive space, felt like a Babylon, it felt like a restriction. It felt confining, it felt hopeless. But I'm thankful that you have shown me that you love me too much to forget about me. God, there's somebody listening right now that's been waiting for a long time. They've been asking for a long time and they feel forgotten and forsaken. I want you to release them now in the name of Jesus. Even if it's not, dear God, into what you have prepared for them, release them from the place of feeling forsaken and forgotten. Release them from that place because that's a, that's a bad place to be in. That's a confining and ugly, dark place. But Lord, thank you that when you release us from that place, we're able to stretch and breathe and move and inhale and exhale and then look towards what you have prepared for us. God, I'm a vessel full of power. I thank you that I have a treasure within me, a good gift that you've given me. Thank you for your spirit that is poured out abundantly. Thank you for your wisdom that embraces me. Thank you that you've kept me like you did the people in Jeremiah 29. You kept me long enough to see what you had in store for me. God, you didn't let me perish. You didn't let me die. You didn't let me live through depression. You didn't let my heart break. You didn't let me lose my mind. You kept me in the place where I was. And then, dear God, when you brought me out, you had preserved me. God, I look better than my experience. I feel better than my experience. I am better than my experience. And all of this happened because you kept me. Now, God, you, if you do nothing else, thank you for that. But now, God, to hear that you have a plan for me and that you want to fill me, that you want to give great gifts to me, things that I didn't even know how to pray for, what to ask for. You know better what to give me according to your word in James chapter 1, better than I know how to ask for it. Thank you, dear God, that you're the giver of good and perfect gifts. There is no shadow of turning in you. Thank you, God. All that I have needed, your hand has provided. Great is your faithfulness, Lord, unto me. God, I admit I have not deserved it, and I have not been deserving of it. But even in this, God, you have preserved and kept and been kind. You have elevated and promoted when I should not have been. You've placed me in places and you've allowed my skills to catch up with my paycheck. God, you've been kind to me. God, we're grateful for this. For we have not always lived and not always been deserving of your blessings. But God, you have kept and sheltered. God, you have come that we might have life and have it to the full. God, we await your filling with the gifts you choose and not the ones that we request. In Jesus' name, all of those who love the Lord said amen. Amen. As always, people who are online, you can uh, give and you can join. Uh, there's information that follows the broadcast each and every week. It shares with you how to give to our church. Uh, even if you're in the building, you can give and you can join. Uh, that's always something that we extend, never uh, to think that people have a church home. Listen, until we see you again, God bless you. Uh, we believe that as we make our way back into the sanctuary, we're going to have more and more opportunities. They exist every week. You might want to join us so we can begin to practice what it feels like to be in worship again. Until then, God bless you. God keep you. Until we meet again, we'll be fine again, and we will be fine again when we meet again.